are you this morning? Morning. It's so good to see you guys. For everyone watching online, it's great to be able to talk to you as well. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Olivia Knapp, and I'm our student ministry assistant here at the Heights. But this morning, I'm talking to the women of the Heights because I need to tell you guys about our women's retreat coming up on September 19th. Now, normally we get to go out of town. It's a whole weekend full of just wonderful fun, great fellowship, and some awesome teaching. But due to, you know, the coronavirus, everything has been, you know, stopped suddenly. So we still want to have women's retreat because we know how important that is. We know how that builds our community of women, and we know how important that is as a function of the church. So we're still going to do a one-day women's retreat on September 19th. It's $20 a person. It's going to be here at the church. It's going to be phenomenal. So if you haven't registered for that, you can do that on the website. There will be a link you can click. Super simple. If you have any questions, just let um, pretty much anyone you see out there know, and they'll be able to give you more information. But this is something we definitely want you guys to be able to be a part of if you can, because it's going to be an absolutely great time. So thank you for letting me talk to you this morning. It's so good to see all your faces. Pastor Raymond's going to come out and do um, some special prayer for us this morning. So thank you, and I hope you guys have a great day. Let's give it up for uh, Olivia. Amen. There you go. I appreciate that very, very, very much. I want to make one, uh, kind of inform you on one thing, and then we're going to pray. Uh, we got some special prayer here. But uh, if, if you are aware, we've been talking about the Hallman family, Chris and Bethany and the needs. Thank you to all of you who have responded uh, to the grocery list and for gift cards for food for the kids that as she and Jace go up to Cincinnati, they're going to be gone a long time, four months, because he's having his uh, chemo and then he's going to have uh, a bone marrow transplant. So he's going to be gone a while and Chris is going to be back there with three of them. And we also have a good, good group right now that's going to clean for them there uh the whole idea of child care has been a little sketchy just by reason of a lot of people are afraid don't want to bring anything to the kids and a lot of people are starting school and they don't have the ability to go there but we want to help them uh if we can help them in any way it'd be great and so what uh, we're going to do is do a love offering and uh, we'll, the main one in here, because you're getting called off guard, be next Sunday. But uh, on our web page, and I don't know if it's on our app or not, uh, if you hit on the giving button, it drops down and says love offering. All that money goes to help them. Hopefully they may be able to get some child care. So I, I don't know how they can use it best. I just know that the stress in, on this family is enormous. And your prayers for them and your love for them would be greatly appreciated. It's been on there now, this love. We put it on there toward the end of the week, and I think already some people have seen it and started giving. Uh, if you want to do that, please do so, uh, and we would appreciate it. You keep them in your prayers as well. Jace has got um, uh, this disease that is an autoimmune disease, and he needs this dash best. You pray for him. Pray for Bethany as she's away from her kids, and pray with Chris as he is here and wanting to make money so that they can keep things going on. Uh, and so you keep that in mind. Now, as we come time to pray, we've got a brother, uh, Kenny Wyndham, who is just uh, a brother. You're back there, ain't you, brother? Standing right back yonder. He's going to have a heart cath Wednesday, but he's going to have open heart surgery replace an aorta on Thursday. So I want to lift Kenny up uh, in there and ask God to make that happen and happen quick and good so kenny we're gonna pray for you in a minute brother uh, but right now i want to ask if you are a teacher an, uh in in school an assistant to a teacher if you're a bus driver uh you work with nutrition or you may even be a principal if you're a student and if you're a parents and grandparents of students that are gearing up i want you all to stand because we're going to pray for you especially this morning stand up Come on. Be proud of it. There you go. There you go. Now, all of us, right? We want to give them a round of applause. That's exactly right. So let's, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your love and your mercy, your grace that you keep bestowing on us. It is awesome, God, how you look after us. And so we come before you because we're interceding on behalf of others. We intercede on behalf of the Hallman family, asking you to please be able to heal Jace 
that you would get to uh, cure out this situation they have and, and allow them, those kids that are behind the three to uh, be taken care of and you would raise up in this church uh, what they need uh, to be able to get through this. And I just pray, God, that you'll get all the glory and all the honor. We pray for our brother Kenny. Thank you so much for Kenny and his love for you. And I pray, God, right now in Christ's name that you'll be with him through the catheterization. But, God, we all join together and pray that you might touch the surgeon's hand and, God, that uh, aorta replacement would go well, smooth. He'd come out of there, recover, and get back serving you. And we'll give you praise right now for what you're going to do in both those situations. But, God, you know right now in this congregation all of those who are uh, teachers and teacher assistants and those who are driving buses and those who are administrators and work with nutrition and you know all of these dear god that our parents that are right now scratching their heads some of them are having to do virtual and uh they're wondering how we're going to do this and how is this going to work i pray dear god that you would give them a sense of confidence that you would help them dear god in christ's name to have low anxiety and stress that you will be around them and protect them and keep them from all harm and that you would help them to carry out what's best for all of them, particularly those kids that are in, in school that need to be there. And we pray, dear God, in this, and I do particularly, God, that there's so many contrasting voices out there. Who knows the truth? Who knows the truth, God? We're torn in so many different ways. And it it's divisive in the country. It's divisive among believers. Some say this and some say this. And I'm asking you in Jesus' name that you know and you would raise up some truth sayers that would just tell us the truth. That, God, we can operate in the truth. The truth sets you free. We know how to do that. We know what's going on. And I pray that you would expose evil people for who they are and what they're trying to do if indeed that's going on. And I pray, dear God, that we as parents and grandparents and those who are supportive of all this, that, God, you, you would give us the truth. The truth sets us free. And so we praise you, God, for all these answers to prayer. We know you're going to do it. We commit our time together in this service. Bless our, our worship team as they lead us. May we put our focus on you and worship you. And I pray, dear God, that when it's all said and done, we'll be glad that we were in the house of the Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Man, it's good to see all you here this morning. Thanks for coming to church. Who knows that God has great things in store for each and every one of us. Amen. Let's lift this song up to Him. Sing this to the Lord, my life. My life is built on your faithfulness. And my hope is held in your promises. And I take each step with your confidence. Because I am yours. Tell him. I am yours. Sing it to him.
awesome job, I'm just telling you. Yeah, that's right, that's right. That was awesome. You know, uh, there's a lot of voices in our life during the week, ain't there? I mean, really and truly, I, it is amazing to me. If you're on Facebook, you have 100 or 500 or 800 or 1,000 friends, and all of them's got their own opinion. Some of them you don't even believe, don't even know. They, don't dis, they disagree with you until you put something on there, and then all of a sudden, right on Facebook, before everybody's eyes and ears and everything else, they let you have it. And next thing you know, I'm hearing from somebody say, well, I unfriended them. <laughs> you know, it's kind of crazy. And we all got those different preachers we listen to and the different authors of books that we, we uh, are checking out, different network stations that we listen to and who's our news of the day, uh, you know, our commentaries and other things on there. The question is, who really should we be listening to? I remember when I finally got saved and uh, pulled out the Bible my mom had bought me that I so rudely rejected when she gave it to me. It was a Schofield reference Bible. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that and some of you may not. But the Schofield Bible was famous for its notes. And it was Schofield's, uh, uh, re he tried to give doctrine and other things, but it was his interpretation of the scripture. And I found out after a while, I was so busy reading the notes, I wasn't reading the scripture. And I was, could quote you more about what Schofield said than what God said. And sometimes we do that. That's one of the dangers. And so that's when I started buying a, a, a noteless Bible to do my own reading first and allow God to speak because God is speaking. And two weeks ago, I started talking about do you hear God speaking? Because he still is. He's speaking today very loudly, very clearly, uh, even in a still, small voice. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself warns us 15 times in the Scripture. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then seven times in Revelation, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so God would have us to be able to hear him when he speaks, not first everybody else, but what God is saying, what's God saying to me? Not what he's saying to me about you. You ever notice we'd like to go to scripture for our proof text. You know what I'm saying? Wait till I get back to work. I got the scripture. I'll lay it on them. How about letting scripture speak to you first? How about letting God speak to you first, right? So last week we looked at having the ears to hear. I started out with Mark 4, 9, which I just quoted. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And a key to hearing God's promises is to live out of his word, his promises. If you want to hear his promise, you've got to live out of them. You've got to let them speak to you till it transforms the way you live. Uh, sometimes we say that we trust God through Christ, and then we live and act like we don't. Titus talked about this in the scripture in Titus chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Uh, he said this, Paul said this to him. He said, everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God but they deny him by the way they live. You see, it, it's, it's that disconnect in there. And I shared last week that a change in behavior begins with a change in thinking. And what you think is what you allow into your head. And so we've got to filter our thoughts so that only those that are in agreement with God's word are allowed to guide us. God will never contradict himself. I'm just telling you won't. And once we begin to look for that agreement between what we're hearing in other places with God's word, then it becomes much more easier to begin to hear him speak clearly more often uh, to us. And you do this, and I listed three things you do. You, number one is you make a deliberate choice and effort to set, to focus your mind on God. You've got to make sure that you decide this is what I want. And you set your mind 
own God. And uh, that may be that you have to ask him in the morning. You may have to say, God, would you help me to have a more disciplined, focused mind on you? And then secondly, you have to make a deliberate choice to exercise your mind by focusing on God. You know, I, I, listen, uh, I, I think if we focused as much on God and hearing him as we do our physical health, our physical nutrition, uh, our hobbies, our pleasures, we would hear God loud and clear. The trouble is we focus on so many things and he is too much of a time and afterthought. We need to be able to have regular times of intensity. Just as some of you get up and you know, I'm going to be running at five o'clock and, and pitching tires over by six. I, you know, it, it, those of you that are, you know, I got to get up at this time, I got to do meal prep for all week, or I've got to do this and this. Listen, set a time where you can focus your mind on God and spend time with him and let him speak to you through his words. And you carry this exercise uh, of setting your mind on God into every area of your life. In other words, when you walk out of the house or you walk out of the church, you don't leave it all behind. It governs how you work. It governs uh, how you treat others at your work. It governs the, uh, what you do in your playtime, what happens in vacation. It governs every area of your life. To be a Christian is not that I am a Christian when I come to church or I'm a Christian in my quiet time, but then I live life the way I want to. You will never hear God that way. He'll never speak to you clearly in that way. Uh, so we've got to bring every thought captive unto God and immediately turn to God in all circumstances, seeking him first, no matter what comes our way. And after a while, it may take you doing this a lot to begin with, but after a while, it'll be spontaneous. As soon as something happens, you'll begin to seek God uh, in there. And I gave you something I'd seen on a gym wall under the, uh, it's an acronym of the word FIT. The F is frequency, the I is intensity, and the T is time. That works in every area of life. But that which you want to master takes you to do it over and over and over again. And it takes the intensity of focus and not giving, giving up. And it takes time. It takes, it builds up. And you begin to grow in your faith. It's essential also for us to maintain uh, this, to have the maintenance of the capacity to hear God. And when we hear from God, it then is on us to make a decision. There's only two choices. I will obey him or I'll disobey. I'll obey him or I'll disobey. And I shared with you that if I tell you something and I'm sharing with you, you can decide whether you want to do it or not. No sweat off your brow. But when God speaks to you, it's a different thing. Will I obey him? Will I disobey him? And what I'm wanting you to know is God is speaking, and if you want to know what success is, in every area of your life, you've got to learn to hear him. Not what somebody else is just saying, but you've got to learn to hear him. And so today I want to go to a second aspect of how you hear God. And I want to begin by reading from James 4, 7 through 8. And this is what James says. He says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, that, that's pretty powerful. But you and I need hearing ears, willing to hear. We talked about that last week. But we also need a pure heart if we're going to hear God when he speaks. And he speaks, and he is speaking. That's true. So, in addition to hearing ears, you and I need a pure, undivided heart if we want to hear him. Now, when we think about pure, to most of us, when we think about it in, in whether it's a, a, a spiritual uh, way or a secular way, we think about it as just the absence of com uh, a contamination or it's the elimination of evil. But that's only part of the meaning of pure. The other part of pure is single-mindedness. Single-mindedness. You need to remember this, single-minded. It's the desire and commitment to one thing, one purpose. Paul said this in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He said, one thing I do. How many things he said he did? 
one thing. You hear me? One thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul knew what it was to allow his life to be run by one thing. And so pure, it means, it's like if I talk about pure goal, it not only means free from dirt, but it means free from everything else. I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's so that even the best of other metals uh, is gone. It's just gold. Even a ring that contains gold and silver and diamonds is not necessarily pure gold. For pure gold is nothing, nothing, nothing less than what? Gold. That's pure gold uh, in that thing. And uh, it is something we need to keep in mind. So similarly, as James has says, and it's said other by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, a pure heart wills and seeks and wants one thing only. Every decision, every choice, every evaluation is based on one desire. So we might say that the heart is really who you are. I think it's pretty, pretty accurate because Jesus said it's from the heart comes all the sin. It's from the heart that comes all the sin. But it's pure, your heart and my heart is pure when all the pretense, all the masks, all the behaviors we do that we think are so good and all these old beliefs and thoughts and guards that we've built up around us are stripped away. They're stripped away. And there's no question as to the importance of a pure heart. For instance, God promises uh, to a group of his people in captivity, he says this to them in G Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me or seek me with all your heart. You notice he didn't say when you seek me when you have time. He didn't say you seek me when, when you feel like it. He said, when you seek me with all of your heart. God's desire for his people, is, again, is expressed in the fact that the Lord is searching up and down the earth for people who have given themselves completely to him. Second Chronicles 16, 9, he says this, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you have been. From now on, you'll be at war because they hadn't been seeking He's looking for people who are wholeheartedly committed to him. And you want me to tell you what he says he'll do? He'll strengthen you. He'll strengthen you more than you can. And so if we're just half-heartedly doing our own thing and, and what our little cadre of people might be telling us about, we're not going to find the inner strength that we have as believers in Christ. And again, God admonishes us through James, which I read just a moment ago. He says, give yourselves to me. Resist the devil. He'll flee. He will flee from you. Come near to me, and I'll come near to you. You're sinners, so clean out all your lives. Purify your hearts. That's what he's saying. In other words, we're trying to follow too much of the time God and the world at the same time, and we've got to avoid that kind of double-minded behavior. You can't, Jesus himself said, you can't serve two masters. You can't, you can't straddle the fence. It don't work. It's all in for him or nothing. So our hearts have to be pure with a desire to follow God alone. So if a pure heart is so important to God, if, 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 it, if the scripture bears that out, how do we cooperate with God in order that we can attain this purity of purpose? How can we cooperate with him? Because it, it, he wants us to cooperate with him and have a purity of purpose. The process takes time and action on our part, time and action on our part, but it's guided by God the Holy Spirit in the life of every sincere and cooperative believer. And it includes uh, definite procedures. The first procedure is cleansing. Cleansing. Do you know the difference between forgiveness and cleansing? Think about this moment. It's the difference between cutting off a weed at ground level with your mower or your weed eater 
and pulling it out by the roots. That's the difference between forgiveness and cleansing. Forgiveness is there. Forgiveness has to do with the results of sin, but cleansing has to do with the cause of sin. You see, so many of us, we like to cut the weed off at the top, but never get down to why, what's going on here, and that's the reason we never break free. It's the reason addicts are still addicts, because they've not got at the root of what's causing them to be an addict. It's the same thing for pride and other things that control our life and dictate the way we go. We're too busy cutting it off at ground level, but letting the root come. Forgiveness, you see, only comes by forgiveness and restitution, making uh, back what maybe has been lost. But cleansing comes from walking in the light. Who is the light? Jesus, right? 1 John 1, 5 and 7 says, God is light and in him there's no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, I, I know for a fact in my own life and I know it as a pastor that far too many of us keep asking God for forgiveness for the same sins. Every time we go to God, it's the same sins over and over and over again. And the reason is that we've never experienced cleansing. We've never got there. The cause of sin has not been dug up and eradicated. We just keep cutting it off at the ground level. If the top of the weed is cut off for a short time, it can't be seen on the surface, right? And we say, oh, everything's good. But the, that weed's going to what? Going to return. It's going to go right back up through there unless it's pulled out by the root. So when we keep committing certain sins, we need to ask God to show us the root. In prayer, we need to say, God, what is the root of this that keeps coming back? And I keep doing it over and over and over again. It's just, it's just there. It's, what do I need to do? What, what, what is the root here? Uh, and, and, and what's the cause of my disobedience? What's causing me? What's in me that's causing? And don't you dare say so-and-so. You see, we're good at blaming other people for our mistakes because we can see them. Jesus said, you can only see a speck in somebody else's eye because you've got a tree in your own. The reality is for, uh, for you and me, stop blaming others and say, God, show me why I'm disobedient. Show me in this thing. And I'm telling you, sometimes it's unpleasant, but how many of you know, I would rather have a surgeon digging me to get cancer out than to just put a Band-Aid over the top of my skin and say, go on, you'll be all right. We've got to get that out, and this is what you've got to do. We've got to ask him what our part is in getting rid of it. God, show me what I need to do to get rid of it. And so to walk in the light means that, we, uh, that the Lord will be asking you and me to make a lifestyle change. And this may be a change in the way you use time. It may be in a discipline. It, it may be some new action, behavior that you're not exhibiting right now that he wants to integrate in your life. Why? Because God wants what's best for you. He knows what's best for you, and you don't know what's best for you. I don't know what's best for me. Your husband, your wife don't know what's best for you. Your mama, your daddy don't know what's best for you. God does. And this is where you've got to get to. It's not that you don't listen to other people. I'm saying until you get to the root of this thing and allow God to show you what it is, you will miss the other relationships. They'll never be what they could be. It's powerful. Now, we don't like, you know, there's a whole move right now that even among people who are proclaimed believers in Christ, with major degrees and everything else to say if god is a god who punishes us then i want nothing to do with that god in other words i want a god who will pat us on the back and love us and we don't have to worry about punishment folks may i say something to you and you're probably not going to like me but part of the problem in america right now is we as parents stop punishing 
I'm just going to tell you, 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 you know that that's a part of life. I, I, and, and this is what the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 10 and 11. But God says here in the, as, to the writer of Hebrews, he says, as the Spirit told him, he says this, discipline, discipline, God disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And why are you reading that? Because God sometimes will allow into your life and my life unpleasant things to get our attention. To be able to say, hey, I'm trying to talk to you. This happened because I allowed it to happen because I'm wanting you to get your attention. It may be a behavior. It may be a sin. It may be something we're, we should be doing and we're not doing it. There's a variety of things. But he does it. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. I never liked any punishment I got. And trust me, I got the real deal. And I got it at, at school at Catawba Heights Elementary. And I got it when I got home. And I got it more than I ever want to admit. But here's the thing. And while I hated it in my teen years, I was ugly to my mom and daddy. I mean, my daddy had had to tackle me. I'm ashamed of it. Tackle me and put me into the closet in there because I was ready to fight. I was just that rebellious. Nobody's going to punish me no more. But I went back after I came to know Jesus. And I told my mama and my daddy, I said, I want to ask you to, number one, forgive me for all that. And I thank you for doing what you did because if you hadn't I would have been wor way worse than I was because when I was tempted to go much further than I was already in I kept thinking about that's a no-no a grown man I'm thinking that's a no-no and I could see my mom and daddy there talking to conscience right talking to my conscience and so God does that because he loves us he allows it if you're a believer in Christ He's not going to let you say you're a believer and live, and, and live like the devil. If you think that, you've missed the whole point, man. You're no longer your own. You're bought with a price. And so God will allow into your life sometimes some things to get your attention. Now, some people say, well, you know, I, I don't like that kind of God. I'm sorry. This is the Father who loves you enough that will get your attention. The second procedure is circumcision. Now, that may sound weird to some of you ladies. But you've got to understand spiritually, because he's talking about circumcision of the heart. What is that? How does that work? What's the results? Well, first thing you've got to remember is that all physical uh, rules of the Old Testament are just shadows of spiritual realities. You understand what I'm saying? Everything you see in the Old Testament, it just, it's just pointing to spiritual realities that are, are coming. And we've got to remember that. And sometimes it's hard to understand. But Paul clearly spells this out in his letter to Romans, where he tells us a person is not a true Jew if he's only a Jew in his physical body. And so true circumcision is not only on the outside of the body. Look at Romans 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Have you ever seen anybody, if you have, if you've ever seen anybody, any person whose whole life was wrapped up in anything, surrounded by and entwined by that one thing over a continuing period of time, you begin to get the picture of a whole heart, right? You know, you know people that that's all, they got something on their mind, that's all they're going to get on, and everything about their life is all entwined with it, you know? Uh, it's easy to get there. You just, everything about you is talking about this. If you, you may talk about other subjects, but you'll get over there. Eventually you'll get there. Your whole life is tied up. That's whole heart. But a circumcised heart, according to God's word, has everything unnecessary 
unnecessary and unessential, don't you love that word? Unessential cut away. It means removing even the good that hinders the best. That's what circumcision of the heart is. Let me just say that one more time. It, it, it is circumcision of the heart is removing everything unnecessary, everything unessential, it gets cut away. It gets cut away. And that means even removing the good that hinders the best. Folks, we got a lot of good stuff in our, in our life going on in our families, our individual lives, and, and everybody else may be doing it. But it hinders us from doing the best thing that God wants us to do. And so we've got to have, we, this is why this is essential. Cleansing takes care of evil roots. Circumcision takes care of the good but ne unnecessary things that crowd out God. Uh, and, and when we understand this, we realize we need some very delicate and deep surgery. We need some delicate and deep surgery in our hearts. And that surgery will place God in a position of priority that no other person, thing, or pursuit can ever know. And I know some people hear that and they say it's even possible. It is, but it's a battle. Because everything in you wants to put other things first. People, I'm just telling you, there's a lot of things vying for first place. There's a lot of things. Our own, this is the reason Jesus said, get rid of selfish ambition. Why? Because we got a lot of things that we think we're going to do, but God's not in it. And he's wanting to cut away that and reprioritize so that we're hearing him. And that takes this pure heart, which is a circumcised heart in that thing. And so how does that take place? How does this whole take place? Well, it's a twofold effort. It's God's and ours. Our part, listen to Jeremiah 4, 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and habits of Jerusalem. What's that mean? That means we get to the root, right? We're going to get to the root. We're going to quit cutting it off at the top. We're going to get to the root, and we are going to make sure that we're working to remove it. It may be we need to cut some things out. It may mean we need to cut some things out and, and get rid of it. Because if we don't, we're going to allow those things to take over. But then there's God's part. Deuteronomy 36 30 verse 6 says, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. So as you are working with God and you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, God is going to do the cutting away. The cutting away of the unnecessary, unessential things that you've allowed to guide your life over and above what he has to say. And as in every phase of the Christian life, heart circumcision is a cooperative action between God and ourselves. He wants us to love him as he loves us in order that we might cooperate with him to get those things out of our heart that are hindering us from hearing him and experiencing life to the full. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it running over. That, that's his desire, for that desire. We put running over more in the wealth aspect than it has been the spiritual blessing of fellowship with God himself. Uh, so let me, let me give you some practical suggestions as we come to the end of this. The practical suggestion is you've got to tell God you want a pure heart. It's the same thing. Sin is sin, whether you're an addict or not. But most addicts, and I've been working with addicts and alcoholics and porn addicts and everybody else for 35 years. And I can tell you that the majority of those who do not really want it never get well. And I've buried far too many of them in their 40s and their early 50s who never really wanted it, but had they wanted it, could have been renewed even physically. And it's that kind of thing that you and I know. You've got to tell God, man, I want this pure heart that I can hear you. I want willing ears 
that I can hear you. I, I, now I'm, wanting, I'm willing to cooperate with you. Do in my life what you need to do that I'll cooperate with you. Secondly, tell him, I love the praise of people too much. Folks, I, I, I had not met too many people that don't like to be praised. And you had to ask him to deliver us from this. Because I'm telling you something, you know, as I do, people can blow your head up. You know? He gave me a deflator. Her name is Janet Johns. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we, we had the, the big power team here. I, told, I think I've told some of you, but the power team was here. At that time, I was working at Gold's Gym, and, and uh, I was pretty stout, and so I was working out there with uh, uh, those guys, and uh, we, they said, let's go over there, and we, they watched me work out and everything, and so they asked me to be a part of their show, two shows. And so I was going to lay on the bed of nails, and I said, R you want me... <laughs> I thought you wanted me to lift up that big telephone pole. They said, no, we want you to lay on the bed of nails. I said, okay. And I, they said, we'll just teach you how to lay down so that you don't jab yourself. I said, okay. And then I said, what else? He said, we're going to put 400 pounds of ice on your chest, and he's going to jump off a ladder with a sledgehammer and break it. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so the big, the big thing was right here. It was right here on the stage. Big old thing. They told me how so I wouldn't punch in my rear end. You know what I'm saying? But I laid down on that thing, and then they lowered down this 400 pounds of ice, and that big dude man jumped off the top of that thing with that sledgehammer, and he hit it. He said, pow, split. I said, big day. And everybody was going crazy, and I stood up. So we met afterwards to a prayer, and the guy, the head of that thing came up to me, and he said, listen, that was awesome. We're going to do, we want you to do something we've not done in a long time. I said, what is it? He said, we're going to do 800 pounds. Next show. I said, bring it on. <laughs> bring it on. Yes, sir, buddy. 800 pounds. So they put me on the bed of nails, lowered down a 400-pound block, and put another 400-pound block on top of me. Now, I can tell you that that thing was heavy. And then that big dude jumped off the top of that ladder man with that sledgehammer. And he, I just kept thinking the whole time, if he misses. But he hit that thing and they both split. Place went crazy. I got up and I felt stuff running down my back. I thought I was bleeding. I thought, man, they done hammered my back with nails. So I went into the office in there and I got somebody coming. I said, I think I might have to go to the hospital. I said, why? I said, because I think all them nails went in my back. They pulled up and said, that's ice. I said, okay. I thought I knew that. And so after that night, me and Janet go down here uh, to Captain's Cap. We sit in there, we get ready to eat, you know. And four Abbey girls, girls who went to Abbey College, they came over and they said, are you Pastor Raymond that was in the power team show? Uh, yeah, I am. Could you give us your autograph? I said, give me an eight pound. And then my wife proceeded for four hours to deflate me to the point that I knew I wasn't half the man I thought I was. And I never performed again. <laughs> but I tell you something, I'd rather have her deflate me than God. Right? Because God loves you, but he knows what will get to you without four hours. He can get to you pretty quick on that. And so you gotta, you got to tell him sometimes, you know, God, I, I like to praise the people too much, and so I'm just asking you to deliver me from that where I can always point it to who? Him. Because you and I, everything we've got is because he allows us to have it. It's just the way it goes. The third thing, suggestion I'd say is ask him to tell you the first step he wants you to take uh, uh, with him. God, show me what it is. What's the first step I can take? Uh, and walk with you in order that I can walk with you and hear you. Tell me what it is. And he may say, well, the first, time you, first thing you got to do is you got to start making time for me because you're busy doing everything else, but you have no time for me. No time for me. You know, there have been an awful lot of pastors and staff across America in the last two years 
hundreds that have fallen. Some were preaching drunk. Some were uh, sexual abusers. They've had to step down. And in, in researching, kind of figuring out what, what's going on, almost every one of them was so full of themselves because they had huge churches, so full of themselves and had gotten that they knew more than God needed them to know so they were no longer in the word for God to speak to them, to, to chastise them, to convict them. Now they were in the word just so they come out here. Go on my autograph. And they fail. And the damage they have done to the name of God and to the church has been astronomical. Astronomical. And if that's true there, guess what? It's just as true for everybody else. And so we've got to ask God, what's the first step? And it may be, make some time for me. Make some priority for me. But then fourth is this. When he begins to show you, listen and obey. Listen and obey. Don't you start figuring out how you can circumvent God or go around what he's wanting to say because you know so much. You, know, you listen to what he's leading you in and you obey. God promised through Jesus. Remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? He said in Matthew 5, 8, he said, Blessed are the what? Pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Now, he wasn't talking when they die. This is an ethical sermon on the mount. It has a lot of ethics in it. And it was about life on this planet. You can hear God and see God when we get to a pure heart. And I hope you'll go back and even listen to this again so that you may be able to do this. This is where God wants us to be. If your heart is pure, your perception of God will be clear. It'll begin to be more definite. And communication with him will be easier. So we're talking about God speaks, he does, and you need a hearing ear and a pure heart. Those are the basic necessities for God's children to be able to hear their father speak. So here's the deal. Those of you that are here, have you heard Jesus speak to you and say, come to me and I'll save you, I'll forgive you? I'll give you a home in heaven. You see, if you don't know Jesus, I'm just telling you, I say this every time, but it's true. There's no getting into heaven. There's no going there when your last breath leaves based on your goodness because our goodness stinks. I mean, who, who likes to, you know, you go down South Point Road, you're going to see deer on the side of the road, buzzards everywhere or raccoons or whatever. Another day I come and buy and there was about 30 of them out there doing their thing and the, and the smell was unbelievable. And I thought, dear man, oh, what in the world is this about? And all of a sudden it was this God himself spoken to me and said, that's all the good you've done. You see, we think that it somehow, and as a believer, when we do it for his sake, from the right motive, for his glory, for his honor, it, it, it smells heavenly. The scripture tells us in Romans. And so if you're here and you've never trusted Christ or watching and you've never trusted Christ, listen, today is the day. Paul said today is the day of salvation. Come to know Christ. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not may be saved, but shall be. But you got to leave all that junk out right here and your part is right now just to get rid of all the things you think was going to get you in good. Get rid of the voices that you've heard that told you, oh, nobody needs to know Jesus. Everybody's going to go if there's such a thing. Now, unfortunately, the road is, it says the way to eternal life is narrow, about like the eye of a needle. But broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in. If you have never trusted Christ, today's the day to do that. Today. Decide right now. I want Jesus. I want to be saved. I want a pure heart. I want listening ears. I want my life to be different. For all of us who are believers in here, listen, is God speaking to you that you've allowed sin 
or you've allowed things and, and maybe even people to veer you away from hearing God first, to letting him speak to you with intentionality to say, I'm talking to you today. Will you make a new commitment that say, Lord, help me. And those are practical things. You get the notes, I think they're in there. You, you look at them. Ask him. Ask him. Your life will be transformed. Our church will be transformed. And I'm praying that a revival will begin in every church uh, uh, that loves Jesus in this country, that a spiritual awakening might arise and save us from what seems to be like the judgment. Bet you I've had 100 people text me and say, is this the judgment? It certainly looks like it, doesn't it? But maybe it's God saying, wake up, church. Wake up, Christian. Start listening to me. Will you make that commitment today? Will you stand with me as we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, I am thankful that you are a loving God that God, your love is so great, you don't want anybody to ever leave this world without you. You don't ever want anyone to perish, but you want everyone to come to know you. And the sad thing is, folk, Father, that there's so many that even knowing that's true will say no. But I'm praying, God, that right now there's someone that's watching or will watch, there's somebody in this auditorium that you've been speaking to a lot. And today is the day, dear God, that you're breathing hard down their neck and saying, come to me. Let, let's begin new life today. Forgiveness of all your sins, past, present, and future. A home in eternity forever with me. But it begins today when you're willing to admit you can't save yourself. Turn away from it. Come to me. He's speaking to you. Will you do that? We do that. Listen, if you are, listen, trust him. It's through trusting in him. It's repentance, turning away, and it's turning to Jesus Christ and him alone and putting all your trust in him. Tell him that right now. Jesus, I'm trusting in what you have done to save me. You have shed your blood for the forgiveness of sin on that cross. You paid the price for sin, which is death. You were buried, but you beat death itself and walked out. Save me. I'm trusting you for that salvation. I'm trusting you for that forgiveness. I'm trusting you for the remainder of my life and evil eternal. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I praise you. I praise you. You praise him. Father, I'm praying for right now my brothers and sisters. God, I, I, I know too often how easy it is to hear many voices and let them control our life. Voices of people who love us, but they don't speak the truth. I just pray, dear God, in Christ's name, that you'd help us right now as believers in Christ to begin to work with you to get to the root beneath the surface, to get it out. Through your power of your Holy Spirit, help us right now. Dig it out. Get it out. Stop mowing it off at the top and it just comes right back. Help us to dig it out right now and leave it here. Leave it here. Help us, dear God, to be able to right now participate and cooperate with you to get rid of those unessential and unnecessary things that have built our life. Help us get rid of pride and get rid of those false beliefs that we've got that maybe we've learned from somebody or whatever, help us get rid of it. That our mind will be focused on one thing and that's you and your glory. Oh God, I praise you for every decision being made in this place today. I'm thanking you God that there's some who walked out of the grave today. They were dead in their sins without hope, but God right now they have walked out of that grave with Jesus. Thank you. I thank you that those who've been bound up by all kinds of things, even as believers, are being set free right now, and I praise you for that. And I ask God that we'll give you glory in our lives, in our families, in our individual lives as a church. Bring revival, oh God, and let it begin in our hearts as we hear you 
from pure hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love you folks. Go in Christ.